IRS went insane. It was fucking horrible! Okay, full disclosure, I had fuck all planned for today. <laughs> Oh god, okay. Hey guys, what's up? It's Big Check Films here. Welcome to a very particular opening night because uh, it's on this release Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. And I figured for the occasion I'd, I'd celebrate in style. Um, today we're going to be reviewing, or re-reviewing slightly, um, a movie that is 90 years old. So near and dear to my heart, and on top of that, um, kind of the reason why I started my review series uh, from the start. Uh, today we're going to talk about the original King Kong. <laughs> because first of all, I haven't talked about this movie fully for over ten, oh, oh, like 10 years. And on top of that, it's its 90th anniversary. I finally watched it with this Blu-ray. I'd never seen it on Blu-ray. I mean, I have, but only in brief portions. But I watched it fully. And I just thought, hey, you know, 10th anniversary of my review series, even though the part three is still coming. And um, on top of that, you know, the 90th anniversary of this buddy, I figured I'd review it. Now, what's funny is, is that I had talked to a few people about if they had any plans whatsoever for the 90th anniversary. Um, I even talked to uh, James, Rolf. I talked to him about it, and I talked to a few other people. And honestly, all of us were like, we had no idea. Nobody has a plan, essentially, uh, for this uh, celebration. So I thought, well, you know what? I owe it to you, the fans. I owe it to myself. I owe it to Kong. I need to talk about it on the date. So we're here to talk about the original 1933 classic. Uh, basically, the movie that I did my first big major skit review on. Um, and yeah, just kind of recap on it. See if there's anything I like, dislike, has my opinion changed, and so on. So what's the plot? Well... If you know what King Kong is, it's it's the modern day fairy tale. Uh, it's basically Beauty and the Beast and the Lost World. Uh, filmmaker Carl Denham, played by Robert Armstrong, uh, in during the Great Depression, he wants to uh, take his crew, uh, his film crew, on a ship called the SS Venture, led by Captain Englehorn, uh, and played by Frank Reacher, who um, they want to go find this island. But the problem is, is that. Movies, motion pictures back then, uh, needed love interests and a, a proper girl. And so the whole time, Carl Denham's like, I need to get a girl for my picture. So he goes out to New York and in the streets and finds a Canadian actress, yes, Faye Ray is Canadian, uh, named Anne Darrow, who uh, he brings on and says, I want you for the lead in my next picture. We sail at six. So they go off on the venture. She meets Jack Driscoll, played by Bruce Cabot, who's the ship first mate, who's also kind of sexist. Um, and then eventually they come across the island and there are natives who see Anne as a, like a golden woman because uh, of her blonde hair, which was actually a wig, by the way. And basically capture her, put her to her god, uh, sacrifice her as to their god, the giant ape Kong, who is 18 feet tall. Of course, Kong's like, oh, pretty gold lady, I'm gonna take her, and takes her off to the jungle, and so the crew have to go get her back, they fight dinosaurs, they capture Kong, they bring him to New York, and you know the rest, basically, um, is how it goes. And, you know, I, I watched at least this movie once a year. So it's pretty much warped into my brain at this point. Um, but the question is, has my opinion changed uh, after 10 years since I reviewed it? Has my thoughts on the film differ? Have I seen any problems with it? Honestly, no. <laughs> it still holds up as my favorite film next to the 76 remake. Like, it is still, it's still pretty damn good. It's still... My favorite film. Um, I guess a little backstory, something I didn't really bring up uh, when I was, you know, first reviewed it. Um, the first time I ever saw King Kong, uh, the original, was when I was about five years old, and my two uncles, uh, basically, who worked in the film industry here in Toronto, they worked on Earthbound Conflict and a few other shows and so on, 
um, had brought along, they knew I was kind of interested in movies. I like Star Wars and all, and Jurassic Park and all that, right? So they brought in, uh, four films, uh, for us to watch, all of which I still have. Um, uh, um, like, basically, they were on VHS, so I have the tapes, the exact copies. Uh, there were four films. There was the first two Jaws films, which scared the crap out of me. And then there was the original King Kong and King Kong Lives, uh, which... I thought at the time it was a standalone sequel, just sort of a what if. Uh, but here you have the original, which I, I remember thoroughly growing up. And I watched it. And at the time, obviously, I liked it. You know, it's got dinosaurs. I remember the T-Rex fight. I remember the Empire State Building. Funny enough, I remember there was an... A, I had a bit of a Mandela effect where as Kong was falling, halfway through, we'd cut to, like, a shot of the airplane zooming by. I don't know why. It's a Mandela effect, and I kind of remember that. Maybe I'll bring that up in a video sometime. But uh, I remember just kind of, you know, enjoying it for what it was. And then it just kind of disappeared. I knew King Kong was a pop culture icon. Then uh, I went to Universal Studios Florida, wrote Confrontation, uh, scared the hell out of me, and brought the fear of Kong into me. And really, my interest in the original being my favorite film didn't really hit me hard enough till I was about... Till the Peter Jackson movie, uh, because Lord of the Rings had just come out, had been one of my favorite series of films to see in the cinemas, and then he said, oh, I'm going to do a remake of King Kong. I'm like, okay, interesting. I didn't know that was your thing, Jackson, but all right. Uh, and then watching his remake, and obviously before his remake came back, I did rewatch the original. I rented it at VHS from a local video store uh, and watched it, and I, I still loved it. Um... And then eventually, you know, just seeing why Jackson loved this film and then doing my own research on it, because I watched a lot of film documentaries and, you know, and, you know, the details about the making of these type of movies. And then watching the, one of my favorite documentaries on, of all time is on this Blu-ray called Production 601, which I would highly recommend everybody watching. Um, I started to really get into this and... It was really hitting me around my 20s that I really loved this film, and then I remade it, then I did my show, and then just over time, this has become my favorite movie. And it didn't really hit me until I was more of an adult, and I could appreciate films like this, not just for history, not just for filmmaking, not just for what it stands for, what it brought to the table um, in terms of pop culture, film, and so on. It's just, it's a masterpiece. Hands down, it's a fucking masterpiece of, of filmmaking, especially for a 90-year-old picture. Like, 90 years this, this guy has been in the culture, and look how much he's brought to the table. So much so, I don't know if this is real or not, I think it's kind of fake, but I like the fascination of it that apparently China just found Skull Island, they found like an island full of dinosaurs, supposedly, but I don't care, it's just that's how pop much in the pop culture. Kong has changed the medium. And it's not just in terms of just, you know, what we see when we think of dinosaurs and creatures. We think of lost islands, native tribes, ancient walls, uh, giant gods, you know, stuff like that. But also just special effects. Without this film, we would not have the blockbusters we have. We would not have all the Marvel shit. We would not have the DC stuff. We wouldn't have Star Wars. Just everything. Everything you know goes back to this. And every filmmaker imaginable has praised this. Japan is the reason they made Godzilla was because of Kong. Um, pretty much all of pop culture, I would actually, I would say also, yeah, this is essentially the first pop culture movie. Like, this set the bat, this set the ground for what we have today with everything we enjoy. Every piece of medium you see here is somehow inspired by King Kong. It just shows the majesty and why he's still, this movie's still king to me. Like, this is still the gold standard of filmmaking, because it's hard to find films that are going to leave this long of an impact. But what else is there to like? I mean, also, you know what? The acting's great. Robert Armstrong is still the best Carl Denham, hands down. And what I love is, like, because later incarnations obviously make him more of the bad guy, and it feels, you look back, it's kind of a little bit forced, but this one, he's one of the heroes. He's just a kind of a cocky hero. He's like a Han Solo, you know? He's not thinking... I mean, like, obviously he cares about Anne and stuff, which, by the way, something I kind of noticed in this film, as well as, like, the 70s remake, do you ever notice that Anne is sort of in a love triangle? <laughs> 
between Carl and Anne, I, or Carl and, and uh, Jack. I know that wasn't probably intentional from the filmmakers, but it's weird that, like, she obviously ends up with Jack Driscoll, but for some reason, she's flirting with Denim a little bit, which I'm like... You two-timing motherfucker, oh my god. So, you know, you notice stuff like that looking back on it, that she was kind of in, like, sort of a poly thing. It was sort of like Shell with Tulio and, and uh, Miguel and El Dorado just, like, hanging around with both guys. Now, that's, I think, what makes Robert Armstrong so cool is that he's just, you know what, he's kind of casual about it. He's not too open up about it. He doesn't have real big feelings for Anne, but at the same time, he still cares about her. So that when Kong goes out into the jungle, obviously he's like, oh my god, I gotta film this. But on top of that, he actually is legitimately concerned with about Anne to the point where even when everybody's essentially given up, he's still saying, no, 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 I believe Jack's gonna go find her. We're gonna go, we're gonna go, I have faith he's gonna find her. Go find her, Jack. Go do it. You, you know, he has such faith. He doesn't come off as a scoundrel. He doesn't come off as a, as a, you know, a, you know, I'm up to something evil. Um, he's just casual. Like, he legitimately cares about people. He's not this asshole. I mean, even when he brings Kong back to New York, there is a part of him you could tell he's, like, thinking, you know, well, hey, I gotta make sure, because, look, it was the time period. It was okay to do stuff back then, even though it wasn't, to torture animals like that. And, you know, like, even when he's, like, looking at Anne, he's like, oh, don't worry, honey, we've knocked some of the fight out of him since you saw him. Like, yeah, you broke this poor animal. But at the same time, again, he still cares about his friends. He still cares about the people he, he, he respects. So it's something that other incarnations don't really do. Like, even the 76 remake... I love Charles Grodin as just this mustache twirling bad guy, but at the same time, it's like, you know, like, there's still that sort of love triangle, even though he pretty much shuts that down from the beginning when, like, Dwan, like, kisses him, and he's like, hey, don't print those, I'm a married man. <laughs> you guarantee the cover of People Magazine, print just one. But to the point, you know, it's still kind of there, like, he still kind of cares, but he's kind of a sleazeball. The Jack Black version is just a con man. He's just a total con man. And... I think it's where, in a way, like, in modern settings, the Denim character is more in line of being a villain. But whereas in the original, he's one, he's actually, to me, the real hero. Like, the actual human hero. I have heard very mixed things about Bruce Cabot as an, as an actor. And not just that, um, his character, Jack Driscoll, I'm gonna be honest, like, I said this before in my original review, this is one of those things that has not changed since I've reviewed it. Jack Driscoll's an asshole. <laughs> He's a big, flabby asshole. And it's ridiculous how much of a dick he is. Like, he's sexist. He's he's just horrible. And, you know, he, once Anne comes in, he's suddenly better? What the fuck? <laughs> it's one of the few moments, sorry, it's one of the few moments in the film that I'm actually kind of like, this has not aged well. I actually think, you know what? Hey, Anne, you know what? You should have broke off with Driscoll and been with Denim. I think Carl deserved you more than Driscoll did. So half of this review is going to be rambling about the love triangle. But outside of that, I mean, like, there are some outdated things, obviously, because times have changed. Uh, the stereotypes are a little iffy, but nah, it's, it's okay. There's one joke... I can't tell if it's racist or I can't tell if it's just weird is when you have the audience uh, waiting to see Kong in the theater and there's that one couple sitting down and he's like, hey, what kind of show is this? I think it's some kind of gorilla. <laughs> Jeez, ain't we got enough of them in New York? I'm like, what the hell was that? <laughs> was that supposed to be like like racist or like a, 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 a jab at other people? Like, what the hell? But there's some jokes that you're just like, I don't get it. It's 1930s humor. But even then, like, you know, I, the culture, like, the style back then was actually pretty in. Like, I like that the outfits, the fedoras, the jackets, the the costumes, all that stuff. That stuff's fantastic. I, I love everything um, about how all of that uh, entails in terms of the culture. And even, like, the way people talk. It's like, oh, I'm going to have to go for my picture, even if I have to marry one. It's like, you know, that the old-timey talk. And, you know, it's very... It's pretty sophisticated, pretty much, uh, like, pretty good writing. Like, I will give credit to Ruth Rose and Ernest uh, Schotzak and everybody who wrote the script, uh, even Edgar Wallace, which, by the way, I do know that there is going to be a uh, book released that is the original Edgar Wallace script, which, goddammit, I want that. I want to read that script. I haven't read The Beast yet. I've read the original 
I think the final few drafts that James Kremlin and Ruth Rose put together, but I haven't read the Edgar Wallace draft. If somebody wants to get me that, uh, feel free. Uh, send it my way via mail. Uh, but to the point, it's like, you know, the writing in this is really good. The dialogue is really good. It's simple. It's to the point. You get everything with the characters. And what I love, too, is that it's all the three leads are based on real people. Carl Denham is Marion C. Cooper, Jack Driscoll is uh, Ernest Schotzak, and Ruth Rose is Anne. You know, like, they, their chemistry matches what these three went on on their adventures making natural dramas and all that stuff. Like, it's fantastic. Um, it's a fantastic way to retell your story in a fantasy setting, which I'm one of those people who still kind of does that, and not many people do nowadays, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but, of course... You know, let's talk about, you know, the special effects. Kong uh, still looks fantastic 90 years later. I like the fact that his de the original design of Kong, because people think, oh, it's just a big gorilla. Yes, that was the intention of Cooper to basically have a giant terror gorilla. But at the same time, you can see even the design in the poster. It's very gorilla mixed with a chimp. Which is something that I will admit that I liked about Kong Skull Island is that, and the MonsterVerse Kong is that they did stick more to the original 33 design where he is more of a chimp-gorilla hybrid, and not so much just a, a silverback, which is what later adaptations did from 76 to Peter Jackson, which is okay. It makes it more real. But at the same time, the, the element of it being an evolved creature is what I liked about the, the original Kong design. Uh, and then, of course, the dinosaurs, which, you know what? Here's the thing. The dinosaurs are fucking awesome. Like, the designs, the sculptures, I know... Uh, what is it? NECA does the figure, the figures of Kong 33. I have one of them. I have two. Hang on. Let me pull these down. I might as well. Because I just might as well show off my collection in this, in this opening night. But you have, um, you know, obviously the NECA Kong figure. This is the, just the basic one. I know they're putting out the, they put out one with the uh, Empire State Building, which I want, and the airplane. But they also put out one with the pterodactyl and the skull crawler. Um, I really want to get those. But, like, these are so articulated. These almost match the, um... The armature is by Marcel Delgado and Willis O'Brien. But then you have uh, the dinosaurs, and the only dinosaur figure I have that's pretty much the 33 is this um, vinyl figure of the T-Rex, the 33 T-Rex. Like, I don't know why. I've always loved this design. I know people have argued it's an Allosaurus, it's a T-Rex. Who cares? Uh, it's just a T-Rex to me, and it's so beautifully sculpted. This is from Japan, by the way. This is from a Toys R Us exclusive in Japan. Uh, special thanks to um, uh, Monstrosities when I met them at G-Fest who gave me this figure. Um, but these guys, this thing's beautiful. Now, I want the rest of the dinosaurs as figures. I want the Brontosaurus. I want the Stegosaurus, the Styracosaurus, the Triceratops. I want these as posable figures. I don't know who has the rights, if NECA does still or not, but please make these. I, I want more of the dinosaur figures of Skull Island, because I will pay for those. These are, like, these are beautiful. But they're just, you know, for 1933, and for designs that were made for a movie called Creation, originally, that were recycled, these are still wonderful dinosaur designs. Like, I still can't get enough of these. So the dinosaurs are great. The action scenes are fantastic. They're iconic. The log scene, the, uh, the the swamp scene, I really like. I really like the swamp scene because you get to see them like, I mean, sure, the cut's a little inconsistent where they're, they're on the swamp and they're like, well, there's no way to trace them. You can hear Kong out in the distance like, oh, there's no sign of his guns and bombs. We'll bump these logs for raft. And they just build a makeshift raft and then they just transition to where it's built. Um, Yeah, I want to know how that thing's built because um, at least, you know, I, I do like that transition. That's one of my favorite cuts. And even in the Jackson movie, they did that in the extended version where they have to start building the raft. Um, when we did ours, we kind of did the same thing. So it's sort of... I like stuff like that. Like, the swamp scene's fantastic. Um, all the stuff in New York's interesting, especially the fact that Kong's size changes from, like, 18 to 24 because they thought, well, because New York's so big, the ape should be bigger. Um, that's cool. And, uh, yes, yeah, the ending. The ending's great. Like, the whole... You know, Empire State Building with the airplanes. It's iconic. It's a pop culture iconic moment. Probably the first of its kind uh, to really show, like, really bring that into public consciousness of, you know, just every time anybody goes to the Empire State Building, you cannot help but see this giant monkey swatting at airplanes. It's that influence, influential. And we've seen so many people parody it, uh, reference it, homage it, love it. You know, it's, it's just iconic. And... You know, Max Steiner's score is still amazing. Like, still, he was the John Williams of his time. Um, I mean, you look at what else this guy's done score-wise. This guy did Casablanca. 
This guy did Gone with the Wind. He did a lot of film scores uh, back then. He was the John Williams of his time. In fact, part of me would love to see John Williams compose all of Max Steiner's scores. In fact, if I saw John Williams do a, a live orchestral recreation of the entire 33 score, I'd be happy with that. Um, I know if you listen to the Lost World score he did, he did pretty much pay homage to Max Steiner in some regards. Just the score itself is beautiful. I know there's a there was a re-release in 1993 of the score that was re-recorded and done with a new orchestra, and it's the best version of the soundtrack to pick up. Um, I would recommend that, but the score is great. Just the, and also sound. This was at a time when sound was in its infancy. Um, you had Murray Spivak do all the sounds of like the the, the Collins roar was a line roar played backwards at half speed. And then you had like the, the, the reptile, the dinosaurs were just like hisses and a panther growls, like the T-Rex's uh, roar, I found this out. It's like some sort of panther growl played backwards or like, right? Which I thought was interesting. Like there's a lot of that stuff. Kong's like beating of his chest was just Spivak just tapping on his assistants on a, on a mic. You know, it's just very huge innovations back in 33, back when sound was still starting up. So... That's really it. I, I, you know, I could talk about this movie forever because I love it so much. Now, in terms of the future, in terms of con reviews and stuff, and, you know, like, this movie's also the reason I have my job, why I did my remake, you know, and so on. Like, there's so much to pack into this one film. But, like, what is there in terms of the future of this for me going forward 90 years later since its release? Part of me, I think what I'm going to do is when I get to 100 episodes of the Kong reviews, I'm going to re-review this movie along with 76 and Peter Jackson's remake. That's going to be a plan going forward for the 100th episode of the Kong reviews, um, is me discussing this film uh, and re-reviewing it, giving it a proper retrospective, uh, more so than I did 10 years ago, because there's some of those reviews I look back, I'm like, that was quick. Um, I could do a little better than that. Uh, so... Maybe some, like, I will definitely re-review this movie when the time comes. I just figured for today, uh, being March 2nd, 2023, the 90th anniversary of the original film, I'd just rediscuss it and just express my love. As you can see, I can be very elaborate very, and talk about this stuff forever, but I don't want to bore you guys. Um, I want to have you guys go on your merry day, but if you can, uh, spend the day and watch the original. Um, it still holds up 90 years later. You look back on it as a piece of history um, of how it created the butterfly effect that we see today in every form of pop culture, media, and film. Um, highly recommended. 10 out of 10. 11 out of 10 if I could. Um, 33 out of 10. Eh? Um, this is a masterpiece. Hands down, sheer masterpiece. It's my favorite film of all time. Uh, next to 76. They are tied. You cannot split them up. Um, and they're just wonderful pieces of filmmaking. Wonderful films in general. Cannot recommend it enough. So let me know your thoughts. If you have seen the original King Kong, you probably have. Uh, let me know in the comment section your thoughts. If you haven't seen it, what the fuck are you doing on my channel? Go watch it right now. I swear to God, I will find you. Um, and just enjoy it. Enjoy it for what it is. And let me know your thoughts. But of course, uh, let me know. Uh, help us out on Patreon. If you guys want to go support the channel, just dollar more. We'll get you early access to all of our content, as well as other special features. Uh, you can send us super chats. You can so on. But, you know, your contributions to uh, us doing reviews with Kong and so on is why we keep doing what we do. And we really appreciate everybody sticking around for, like, not just ten, like, you know, like ten years of this show. Uh, not of opening night, but of the Big Jack Films reviews, Kong reviews. Like, ten years have gone by since I've been doing this. And I did it on a whim. I did it out of boredom. I did it as a response to James Rolfe's Monster Madness godzilla -thon. And it's just spiraled into something I'm, I... There are no words to describe how much I appreciate the like you guys sticking around for so long. And just me talking about this giant 18-foot monkey from an island southwest of Sumatra for 10 years. I know I've expanded on more reviews and stuff, but you guys are the reason I keep doing what I do. And having basically getting paid to fulfill my dreams. So, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you so much. We'll be back with more opening nights, uh, hopefully next week, uh, which I'm going to be covering a movie that I just watched and I've never seen, and I loved it. Spoilers for the next review. Uh, v for Vendetta. I've, I finally took a look at it out of sheer whim, and you're going to see my thoughts on it hopefully next week. So, until the next video, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys later. This is Big Jack Film signing off saying... Hail to the king, watch the original King Kong today, 
And um, happy 90th birthday, buddy. You earned it. I'll see you at 100.